Welcome back, friends. I think we're going to call this um, part 11. Because remember, I skipped one part. And we actually are almost done. So we'll have this part and then part 12, if you will. Um, I'm glad you're back after the lonely one. Did that just bring up any memories for you from, from your childhood summers? Uh, this next section is one of my favorites in this book. I know I've, I've spoken about my love for my own grandmother, um, and I'm sure it will bring up wonderful memories for you of, of a special person in your family that had such an impact in your life. So let's get started with Ray Bradbury's Dandelion Wine. She was a woman with a broom or a dustpan or a wash rag or a mixing spoon in her hand. You saw her cutting pie crusts in the morning, humming to it, or you saw her setting out the baked pies at noon or taking them in, cool at dusk. She rang porcelain cups like a Swiss bell ringer to their place. She glided through the halls as steadily as a vacuum machine, seeking, finding, and setting to rights. She made mirrors out of every window to catch the sun. She strolled but twice through any garden trowel in hand and the flowers raised their quivering fires up on the warm air in her wake. She slept quietly and turned no more than three times in a night, as relaxed as a white glove to which at dawn a brisk hand will return. Waking, she touched people like pitchers to set their frames straight. But now, Grandma, said everyone, great grandma. Now it was as if a huge sum in arithmetic were finally drawing to an end. She had stuffed turkeys, chickens, squabs, gentlemen and boys. She had washed ceilings, walls, invalids and children. She had laid linoleum, repaired bicycles, wound clocks, stoked furnaces, swapped iodine on 10,000 grievous wounds. Her hands had flown all around, about and down, gentling this, holding that, throwing baseballs, swinging bright croquet mallets, seeding black earth or fixing covers over dumplings, ragouts and children wildly strewn by slumber. She had pulled down shades, pinched out candles, turned switches, and grown old. Looking back on 30 billions of things started, carried, finished, and done, it all summed up totaled out. The last decimal was placed. The final zero swung slowly into line. Now, chalk in hand, she stood back from life a silent hour before reaching for the eraser. Let me see now, said Great Grandma. Let me see. With no fuss or further ado, she traveled the house in an ever-circling inventory, reached the stairs at last, and making no special announcement, she took herself herself up three flights to a room where silently she laid herself out like a fossil imprint under the snowing cold sheets of her bed and began to die. Again the voices, Grandma! Great Grandma! The rumor of what she was doing dropped down the stairwell, hit and spread ripples through the rooms, outdoors and windows and along the street of elms to the edge of the green ravine. Here now! Here! The family surrounded her bed. Just let me lie, she whispered. Her ailment could not be seen in any microscope. It was a mild but ever deepening tiredness, a dim weighing of her sparrow body, sleepy, sleepier, sleepiest. As for her children and her children's children, it seemed impossible with, that with such a simple act, the most leisurely act in the world, she could cause such apprehension. Great Grandma, now listen. What you're doing is no better than breaking a lease. This house will fall down without you. You must give us at least a year's notice. Great Grandma opened one eye. Ninety years gazed out calmly out of her physicians like a, like a dust ghost from a high couple of window in a fast emptying house. Tom? The boy was sent alone to her whispering bed. Tom, she said faintly far away. In the southern seas, there's a day in each man's life 
when he knows it's time to shake hands with all his friends and say goodbye and sail away. And he does, and it's natural. It's just his time. That's how it is today. It's so like you sometimes sitting through Saturday matinees until 9 at night when we send your dad to bring you home. Tom, when the time comes that the same cowboys are shooting the same Indians on the same mountaintop, then it's best to fold back the seat and head for the door with no regrets and no walking backward up the aisle. So I'm leaving while I'm still happy and still entertained. Douglas was summoned next to her side. Grandma, who will shingle the roof next spring? Every April, for as far back as there were calendars, you thought you heard woodpeckers tapping the house top. But no, it was great grandma, somehow transported, singing, pounding nails, replacing shingles high in the sky. Douglas, she whispered, don't ever let anyone do the shingles unless it's fun for them. Yes, um, look around come April and say, who'd like to fix the roof? Whichever face lights up is the face you want, Douglas. Because up there on that roof, you can see the whole town going through the, count the country. And the country going toward the edge of the earth. And the river shining and the morning lake and birds on the trees down under you and the best of the wind all around above. Any one of those should be enough to make a person climb a weather vane some spring sunrise. It's a powerful hour if you give it half a chance. Her voice sank to a soft flutter. Douglas was crying. She roused herself again. Now, why are you doing that? Because, he said, you won't be here tomorrow. She turned a small hand mirror from herself to the boy. He looked at her face and himself in the mirror and then at her face again and he said, tomorrow morning I'll get up at seven and wash behind my ears. I'll run to church with Charlie Woodman I'll picnic at Electric Park. I'll swim, run barefoot, fall out of the trees, chew spearmint gum. Douglas, Douglas, for shame. You cut your fingernails, don't you? Yes, um. And you don't yell when your body makes itself over every seven years or so. Old cells dead and new ones added to your fingers and your heart. You don't mind that, do you? No, ma'am. Well, consider them, boy. Any man saves fingernail clippings is a fool. You ever see a snake bother to keep his peeled skin? That's about all you've got here today in this bed is fingernails and snake skin. One good breath would send me up in flakes. Important thing is, not the me that's lying here, but the me that's sitting on the edge of the bed looking back at me. And the me that's downstairs cooking supper, or out in the garage under the car, or in the library reading. All the new parts, they count. I'm not really dying today. No person ever died that had a family. I'll be around a long time. A thousand years from now, a whole township of my offspring will be biting sour apples in the gumwood shade. That's my answer to anyone asked big questions. Quick now, send in the rest. At last, the entire family stood, like people seeing someone off at the rail station, waiting in the room. Well, said Great Grandma, there I am. I'm not humble, so it's nice seeing you standing around my bed. Now, next week, there's late gardening, a closet cleaning, and clothes buying for the children to do. And since that part of me, which is called, for convenience, Great Grandma, won't be here to step it along. Those other parts of me called Uncle Bert and Leo and Tom and Douglas and all the other names will have to take over each to his own. Yes, Grandma. I don't want any Halloween parties here tomorrow. Don't want anyone saying anything sweet about me. I said it all in my time and my pride. I've tasted every, every victual and danced every dance and now there's one last tart I haven't bit on. One tune I haven't whistled, but I'm not afraid. I'm truly curious. Death won't get a crumb by my mouth. I won't keep and savor, so don't you worry over me. Now all of you go and let me find my sleep. Somewhere, a door closed quietly. That's better. 
alone, she snugly, luxuriously down through the warm snowbank of linen and wool, sheet and cover, and the colors of the patchwork quilt were bright as the circus banners of old time. Lying there, she felt as small and secret as on the mornings 80 some odd years ago, when wakening, she comforted her tender bones in bed. A long time back, she thought, I dreamed a dream and was enjoying it so much when someone wakened me, and that was the day when I was born. And now, now let me see. She cast her mind back, where was I? She thought, 90 years. How to take up that thread and the pattern of that lost dream again? She pulled out a small hand, there. Yes, there, that was it. She smiled, deeper in the warm snow hills, she turned her head upon the pillow. That was better. Now, yes, now she saw it shaping in her mind quietly. And with a serenity like a sea moving along an endless and self-refreshing shore, now she let the old dream touch and lift her from the snow and drift her above the scarce remembered bed. Downstairs, she thought, they are polishing the silver and rummaging the cellar and dusting in the halls. She could hear them living all through the house. It's all right, whispered Great Grandma as the dream floated her. Like everything else in this life, it's fitting. And the sea moved her back down the shore. A ghost, cried Tom. No, said a voice, just me. The ghastly light flowed into a dark apple-scented bedroom. A quart-sized mason jar seemingly suspended upon space flickered many twilight-covered flakes of light on and off. In this pallid illumination, Douglas's eyes shone and shone pale and solemn. He was so tan his face and hands were dissolved in darkness, and his nightgown seemed a disembodied spirit. My gosh, hissed Tom, two dozen, three dozen fireflies. Shh, for crying. What you got him for? We got caught reading nights with flashlights under our sheets, right? So nobody will suspect an old jar of fireflies. Folks will think it's just a night museum. Doug, you're a genius. But Douglas did not answer. Very gravely, he placed the intermittently signaling light source upon the night table and picked up his pencil and began to write large and long on his tablet. With the fireflies burning, dying, burning, dying, and his eyes glinting with the three dozen fugitive bits of pale green color, he block printed for 10 and then 20 minutes, aligning and realigning, writing and rewriting the facts that he had gathered all too swiftly during the season. Tom watched, hypnotized by the small bonfire of insects leaping and furling within the jar, until he froze, sleeping, raised on elbow, while Douglas wrote on. He summed it all up on a final page. You can't depend on things because, like machines, for instance, they fall apart or rust or rot, or maybe never get finished at all, or wind up in garages. Like tennis shoes, you can only run so far, so fast, and then the earth's got you again. Like trolleys, trolleys, big as they are, always come to the end of the line. You can't depend on people because they go away, strangers die, people you know fairly well die, friends die, people murder people like in books, and your own folks can die. So, he held on to a double fistful of breath, let it hiss out slow, grabbed more breath and let it whisper through his tight gritted teeth. So, he finished in huge, heavily blocked capitals. So if trolleys and runabouts and friends and near friends can go away for a while or go away forever or rust or fall apart or die and if people can be murdered and if someone like great grandma who's going to live forever can die. If all of this is true, then I, Douglas Spaulding, someday must but the fireflies, as if extinguished by his somber thoughts, had softly turned themselves off. I can't write any more anyway, thought Douglas. I won't write any more. I won't. I won't finish it tonight. He looked over at Tom asleep on his upraised elbow and hand. 
He touched Tom's wrist and Tom collapsed into a sighing ruin back upon the bed. Douglas picked up the mason jar with the cold, dark lumps in it and the cool lights flicked on again as if given life by his hand. He lifted the mason jar to where it shone fitfully on his summing up. The final words waited to be written. But he went instead to the window and pushed the screen frame out. He unscrewed the top of the jar and tilted the fireflies in a pale shower of sparks down the windless night. They found their wings and flew away. Douglas watched them go. They departed like the pale fragments of a final twilight in the history of a dying world. They went like the few remaining shreds of warm hope from his hand. They left his face and his body and the space inside his body to darkness. They left him empty as the mason jar, which now, without knowing that he did so, he took back into bed with him when he tried to sleep. There she sat in her glass coven, night after night, her body melted by the carnival blaze of summer, frozen in the ghost winds of winter, waiting with her sickle smile and carved, hooked, and wax-poured nose, hovering above her pale pink and wrinkled wax hands, poised forever above the ancient fanned-out deck of cards. The Tarot Witch. A delicious name. The Tarot Witch. You thrust a penny in the silver slot, and far away below, behind inside machinery, groaned and cogged, levers stroked, wheels spun, and in her case, the witch raised up her glittery face to blind you with a single needle stare. Her Im implacable left hand moved down to stroke and fritter enigm enigmatic tarot cards, skulls, devils, hanging men, hermits, cardinals, and clowns, while her head hung close to delve your misery or murder, hope or health, your rebirths each morning and death's renewal by night. Then she spidered a calligrapher's pen across the back of a single card and let it titter down the chute into your hands, whereupon the witch, with the last veiled glimmer of her eyes, froze back in her eternal call for weeks, months, years, awaiting the next copper penny to revive her from oblivion. Now, waxen, dead, she suffered the two boys' approach. Douglas fingerprinted the glass. There she is. It's a wax dummy, said Tom. Why do you want me to see her? All the time asking why, yelled Douglas. Because, that's why, because. Because, the arcade lights dimmed. Because. One day you'll discover you are alive. Explosion, concussion, illumination, delight. You laugh, you dance around, you shout. But not long after, the sun goes out, snow falls, but no one sees it on an August noon. At the cowboy matinee last Saturday, a man had dropped down dead on the white hot screen. Douglas had cried out. For years, he had seen billions of cowboys shot, hung, burned, destroyed, but now, this one particular man. He'll never walk, run, sit, laugh, cry, won't do anything ever, thought Douglas. Now he's turning cold. Douglas's teeth chattered, his heart pumped sludged in his chest. His, I, he shut his eyes and let the convulsion shake him. He had to get away from these other boys because they weren't thinking about death. They just laughed and yelled at the dead man as if he still lived. Douglas and the dead man were on a boat pulling away with all the others left behind on the bright shore, running and jumping, hilarious with motion, not knowing that the boat, the dead man and Douglas were going, going, and now gone into the darkness. Weeping, Douglas ran to the lemon-smelling men's room, where, sick, it seemed a fire hydrant churned three times from his throat. And waiting for the sickness to pass, he thought, all the people I know who died this summer, Colonel Freely dead? I didn't kn I know it before, but why? <laughs> Great Grandma dead too? Really? Truly? Not only that, but... He paused. Me? No, they can't kill me. Yes, said a voice. Yes, any time they want to, they can. No matter how you kick or scream, they just put a big hand over you and you're still. I, I don't want to die. Douglas screamed without a sound. You'll have to anyway, said the voice. You'll have to anyway. 
The sunlight outside the theater blazed down upon an unreal street. Unreal buildings and people moving slowly as if under a bright and heavy ocean of pure burning gas and him thinking that now, now at last he must go home and finish out the final line in his nickel tablet. Someday I, Douglas Spaulding, must die. It had taken him 10 minutes to get up enough courage to cross the street, his heart slowing, and then there was the arcade and he saw the strange wax witch back where she had always hidden in cool, dusty shadows with the fates and furies tucked under her fingernails. A car passing flashed an explosion of light through the arcade, jumping the shadows, making it seem that the wax woman nodded swiftly for him to enter. And he had gone in at the witch's summoning and come forth five minutes later, certain of survival. Now he must show Tom. She looks almost alive, said Tom. She is alive, I'll show you. He shoved a penny in the slot. Nothing happened. Douglas yelled across the arcade at Mr. Black, the proprietor, seated on an upended soda pop crate, uncorking and taking a swig from a three-quarters empty bottle of brown-yellow liquid. Hey, something's wrong with the witch. Mr. Black shuffled over, his eyes half closed, his breath sharp and strong. Something's wrong with the pinball, wrong with the peep show, wrong with the electrocute yourself for a penny machine. He struck the case. Hey in there, come alive. The witch sat unperturbed. Cost me more to fix her each month than she earns. Mr. Black reached behind the case and hung a sign out of order over her face. She ain't the only thing things out of order. Me, you, this town, this country, the whole world. To hell with it. He shook his fist at the woman. The junk heap for you. You hear me? The junk heap. He walked off and plunged himself down on the soda pop crate to fill the coins in his money apron again, like it was his stomach giving him pain. She just can't, oh, she can't be out of order, said Douglas stricken. She's old, said Tom. Grandpa said she was here when he was a boy and before, so it's bound to be some day she'd conk out and... Come on now, whispered Douglas. Oh, please, please, write so Tom can see. He shoved another coin stealthily into the machine. Please. The boys pressed the glass. Their breath made cumulus clouds on the pane. Then, deep inside the box, a whisper, a whir. And slowly, slowly, the witch's head rose up and looked at the boys, and there was something in her eyes that froze them as her hand began to scrabble almost frantically back and forth upon the tarot's to pause, hurry on, return. Her head bent down, one hand came to rest, and a shuddering shook the machine as the other hand wrote, paused, wrote, and stopped at last with a paroxysm so violent the glass in the case chimed. The witch's face bent in a rigid mechanical misery, almost fisted into a ball. Then the machine, the machinery gasped and a single clog, cog slipped and a tiny tarot card tickled down the flue into Douglas's cupped hands. She's alive! She's working again! What's the card say, Doug? It's the same one she wrote for me last Saturday. Listen. And Douglas read, Hey, Nani, no. Men are fools that wish to die. It's not fine to dance and sing when the bells of death do ring. It's not fine to swim in wine and turn upon the toe and sing, hey, nani no. When the winds blow and the seas flow, hey, nani no. Is that all it says, says Tom? At the bottom is a message, prediction, a long life, and a lively one. That's more like it. Now how about one for me? Tom put his coin in and the witch shuddered. A card fell onto his hand. Last one off the premises is the witches behind, said Tom calmly. They ran out so fast the proprietor gasped and clutched 45 copper pennies in one fist, 36 in the other. Outside in the glare of the uneasy street lights, Douglas and Tom made a terrible discovery. The tarot card was empty. There was no message. Well, that can't be. Don't get excited, Doug. It's just a plain old card. We only lost a penny. It's not a plain old card. It's more than a penny. It's life and death. 
Under the fluttering moth light in the street, Douglas's face was milky as he stared at the card and turned it, rustling, trying somehow to put words on it. She ran out of ink. She never runs out of ink. He looked at Mr. Black, sitting there finishing off his bottle and cursing, not knowing how lucky he was living in the arcade. Please, he thought, don't let the arcade fall apart too. Bad enough that friends disappeared, people were killed and buried in the real world, but let the arcade run along the way it was. Please, please. Now Douglas knew why the arcade had drawn him so steadily this week and drew him still tonight, for there was a world completely set in place, predictable, certain, sure, with its bright silver slots, its terrible gorilla behind glass forever, stabbed by waxen hero to save still more wax and heroin, and then the flipping waterfall chitter of keystone cops on eternal photographic spindles set spiraling in darkness by Indian head pennies under naked bulb light. The cops, forever in collision or near collision, with train, truck, streetcar, forever gone off piers and oceans, which did not drown, because they were rushed to collide again with train, truck, streetcar, dive off old and beautifully familiar pier, worlds within worlds, the penny peak shows which you crank to repeat old rites and formulas, there when you wish the Wright brothers sailed sandy winds at Kitty Hawk, Teddy Roosevelt exposed his dazzling teeth, San Francisco was built and burned, burned and built, as long as sweaty coins fed self-satisfied machines. Douglas looked around at this night town where anything at night might happen, a minute from now, here, by night or day, how few the slots to shove your money in, how few the cards delivered to your hand for reading, and if read, how few made sense. Here in the world of people, you might give time, money, and prayer with little or no return. But there in the arcade, you could hold lightning with the can-you-take-it electrical machine when you pried its chromed handles apart as the power wasp stung sizzled, sewed your vibrant fingers. You punched a bag and saw how many hundred pounds of sinew were available in your arm to strike the world if it needed to be struck. There, grip a robot's hand, Indian wrestle out your fury and light the bulbs, half up a numbered chart where fireworks at the summit proved your violence supreme. In the arcade then, you did this and this and that and that occurred. You came forth in peace as from a church unknown before. And now, now? The witch moving but silent and perhaps soon dead in her crystal coffin. He looked at Mr. Black droning there, defying all worlds, even his own. Someday the fine machinery would rust from lack of loving care. The keystone cops freeze forever half in, half out of the lake, half caught, half struck by locomotive. The Wright brothers never get their kite machine off the ground. Tom, Douglas said, we got to sit in the library and figure this thing out. They moved on down the street, the white unwritten card passing between them. They sat inside the library in the lidded green light, and then they sat outside on the carved stone lion, dangling their feet over its back and frowning. Old man black, all the time screaming at her, threatening to kill her. You can't kill what's never lived, Doug. He treats the witch like she's alive or was once alive or something, screaming at her so maybe she's finally given up or maybe she hasn't given up at all but taken a secret way to warn us her life's in danger. Invisible ink, lemon juice maybe. There's a message here she didn't want Mr. Black to see in case he looked while we were in his arcade. Hold on, I got some matches. Why would she write us, Doug? Hold the card here. Douglas struck a match and ran it under the card. Ouch! The words ain't on my fingers, Doug, so keep the match away. There! cried Douglas, and there it was. A faint, spidery scrawl, which began to shape itself in a spiral of light. A word, two words, three. The card, it's on fire! Tom yelled and let it drop. Stop on it! But by the time they had jumped up to smash their feet on the stony spine of the ancient lion, the card was a black ruin. Doug, now we'll never know what it said. Douglas held the flaking warm ashes in the palm of his hand. No, I saw it. 
I remember the words. The ashes blew about in his fingers, whispering. You remember in that Charlie Chase comedy last spring where the Frenchman was drowning and kept yelling something in French, which Charlie Chase couldn't figure? Secures, secures. And someone told Charlie what it meant, and he jumped in and he saved the man. While on this card, with my own eyes, I saw it. Secures. Why would she write it in French? Well, so Mr. Black wouldn't know, dumb. Doug, it was just an old watermark coming out when you scorched the card. Tom saw Douglas's face and stopped. Okay, don't look mad. It was sucker or whatever. But there were other words. Madame Tarot, it said. Tom, I got it now. Madame Tarot's real. Lived a long time ago. Told fortunes. I saw her pictures once in the encyclopedia. People came from all over Europe to see her. Well, don't you figure it out now yourself? Think, Tom, think. Tom sat back down on the lion's back, looking along the street to where the arcade lights flickered. That's not the real Mrs. Tarot. Inside that glass box, under all that red and blue silk and all that old half-melted wax, sure. Maybe a long time ago, someone got jealous or hated her and poured wax over her and kept her prisoner forever. And she's passed down the line from villain to villain and wound up here centuries later in Greentown. Working for Indian head pennies instead of the crown heads of Europe. Villains? Mr. Black? Names black. Shirts black. Pants are black. Ties black. Movie villains wear black, don't they? But why didn't she yell last year, the year before? Who knows? Every night for a hundred years, she's been writing messages and lemon juice on cards. But everybody read her regular message. Nobody like thought like us to run a match over the back to bring out the real message. Lucky I know what secures means. Okay, she said help. Now what? We save her, of course. Steal her out from under Mr. Black's nose? Huh? wind up witches ourselves in glass boxes with wax poured over our faces the next 10,000 years? Tom, the library's here. We'll arm ourselves with spells and magic filters to fight Mr. Black. There's only one magic filter we'll fix, Mr. Black, said Tom. Soon he gets enough pennies. Any one evening, he, well, let's see. Tom drew some coins from his pocket. This just might do it, Doug. You go read the books. I'll run back and look at the Keystone Cops 15 times. I never get tired. By the time you meet me at the arcade, it'll be the old filter will be working for us. Tom, I hope you know what you're doing. Doug, you want to rescue this princess or not? Douglas whirled and plunged. Tom watched the library doors wham shut and settle. Then he leaped over the lion's back and down into the night. On the library steps, the ashes of the tarot car fluttered and blew away. <coughs> the arcade was dark inside. The pinball machine lay dim and enigmatic as dust scribblings in a giant's cave. The peep shows stood with Teddy Roosevelt and the Wright brothers faintly smirking or just cranking up a wooden propeller. The witch sat in her case, her waxen eyes called. Then suddenly one eye glittered. A flashlight bobbed outside through the dusty arcade windows. A heavy figure lurched against the locked door. A key scrabbled into the lock and the door slammed open, stayed open. There was a sound of thick breathing. It's only me, old girl, said Mr. Black, swaying. Outside on the street, coming along with his nose in a book, Douglas found Tom hiding in a door nearby. Shh, said Tom. It worked. Stone cops 15 times, and when Mr. Black heard me drop all that money in, his eyes popped. He opened the machine, took out all the pennies, threw me out, and went across to the speakeasy for the magic filter. Douglas crept up and peered into the shadowy arcade and saw the two gorilla figures there, one not moving at all, the wax heroine in his arms, the other one standing, stunned in the middle of the room, weaving slightly from side to side. Oh, Tom whispered Douglas. You're a genius. He's just full of magic filter, ain't he? You can say that again. What did you find out? Douglas tapped the book and talked in a low voice. 
Madame Tarot, like I said, told all about death and destiny and stuff in rich folks' parlors, but she made one mistake. She predicted Napoleon's defeat and death to his face. So, Douglas's voice faded as he looked again through the dusty window at that distant figure seated quietly in her crystal case. Secures, murmured Douglas. Old Napoleon just called in Madame Tussauds wax world and had them drop the tarot witch alive in boiling wax and now now watch out dog mr black's in there he's got a club or something this was true inside cursing horribly the huge figure of mr black lurched in his hand a camping knife seething on the air six inches from the witch's face he picked on her because she's the only human looking thing in the whole darn joint said tom he won't do her no harm. He'll fall over any second and sleep it off. No, sir, said Douglas. He knows she's warned us. We're coming to rescue her. He doesn't want us revealing his guilty secret. So maybe tonight he's going to destroy her once and for all. How could he know she warned us? We didn't even know ourselves till we got away from here. He made her tell, put coins in the machine. That's one thing she can't lie on. The cards, all them tarot skulls and bones. She just can't help telling the truth and she gave him a card. Sure, with two little old knights on it. No bigger than kids, you see. That's us, clubs in our hands, coming down the street. One last time, cried Mr. Black from the cave inside. I'm putting the coin in one last time now. Damn it, tell me. Is this damn arcade ever going to make money or do I declare bankruptcy? Like all women, sit there, cold fish, while a man starves. Give me the card. There, now let me see. He held the card up to the light. Oh my gosh, whispered Douglas. Get ready. No, cried Mr. Black. Liar, liar. Take that. He smashed his fist through the case. Glass exploded in a great shower of starlight, it seemed, and fell away in darkness. The witch sat naked in the open air, reserved and calm, waiting for the second blow. No! Douglas plunged through the door. Mr. Black! Doug! cried Tom. Mr. Black wheeled at Tom's shout. He raised the knife blindly in the air as if to strike. Douglas froze. Then, eyes wide, lids blinking once, Mr. Black turned perfectly, so he fell with his back toward the floor and took what seemed a thousand years to strike. His flashlight flung from his right hand, the knife scuttling away like a silverfish from the left. Tom moved slowly in to look at the long-strewn figure in the dark. Doug, is he dead? No, just the shock of Madame Tarot's prediction. Boy, he's got a scalded look. Horrible. That's what the card must have been. The man slept noisily on the floor. Douglas picked up the strewn tarot cards, put them trembling in his pocket. Come on, Tom. Let's get her out of here before it's too late. Kidnap her? You're crazy. You want to be guilty of aiding and abetting an even worse crime? Murder, for instance? For gosh sakes, you can't kill a darn old dummy. But Doug was not listening. He had reached through the open case, and now, as if she had waited for too many years, the wax tarot witch, with a rustling sigh, leaned forward and fell slowly, slowly down into his arms. The town clock struck 9.45. The moon was high and filled all the sky with a warm but wintry light. The sidewalk was solid silver on which, on which black shadows moved. Douglas moved with the thing of velvet and fairy wax in his arms, stopping to hide in pools of shadows under trembling trees alone. He listened, looking back, a sound of running mice. Tom burst around the corner and pulled up beside him. Doug, I stayed behind. I was afraid Mr. Black was, well, then he began to come alive, swearing, oh, Doug, if he catches you with his dummy, what will our folks think? Stealing, quiet. They listened to the moonlit river of street behind them. Now, Tom, you can come help me rescue her, but you can't say you can't if you say dummy or talk loud or drag along so much dead weight. I'll help. Tom assumed half the weight. My gosh, she's light. She was real young when Napoleon Douglas stopped. Old people are heavy. That's how you tell. But why? Tell me why all this running around for her, Doug. Why? Why? 
Douglas blinked and stopped. Things had gone so fast. He had run so far and his blood was so high. He had long since forgotten why. Only now, as they moved along up this sidewalk, shadows like black butterflies on their eyelids, the thick smell of dusty wax on their hands, did he have time to reason why and slowly speak of it. His voice was strange as moonlight. Tom, a couple weeks ago I found I was alive. Boy, did I hop around. And then just last week in the movies I found out I'd have to die someday. I never thought of that really. And all of a sudden it was like knowing the YMCA was going to be shut up forever or school, which isn't so bad as we like to think, being over for good. And all the peach trees outside town shriveling up and the ravine being filled in. And no place to play ever again. And me, sick in bed for as long as I could think. And everything dark and I got scared. So, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do is, is this. Help Madame Tarot. I'll hide her a few weeks or months while they look up in the magic black books and the library and at the library how to undo spells and get her out of the wax to run around in the world again after all this time she'll be so grateful she'll lay out the cards with all those devils and cups and swords and bones on them and tell me what some poles to walk around and when to stay in bed on certain Thursday afternoons I'll live forever or next thing to it you don't believe that yes I do or most of it watch it now here's the ravine We'll cut down through by the dump heap and Tom stopped. Douglas had stopped him. The boys did not turn, but they heard the heavy clubbing blows of feet behind them, each one like a shotgun sent off in the bed of a dry lake not far away. Someone was shouting and cursing. Tom, you let him follow you. As they ran, a giant hand lifted and tossed them aside and Mr. Black was laying there. It was there, laying to left and right, the boys crying out on the grass, saw the raving man, spittle showering the air from his biting teeth and widening lips. He held the witch by her neck with one arm and glared with fiery eyes down on the boys. This is mine to do with what I like. What you mean taking her caused all my trouble, money, business, everything. Here's what I think of her. No, shouted Douglas. But like a great iron catapult, the huge arms hoisted the figure up again against the moon and flourished and wheeled the fragile body upon the stars and let it fly out with a curse and a rustling wind down the air into the ravine to tumble and take avalanches of junk with her into white dust and cinders. No, said Douglas sitting there looking down. No. The big man toppled on the rim of the hill, gasping. You just thank God it wasn't you I did that to. He moved unsteadily away, falling once, getting up, talking to himself, laughing, swearing, then gone. Douglas sat on the edge of the ravine and wept. After a long while, he blew his nose and he looked at Tom. Tom, it's late. Dad'll be out walking, looking for us. We should have been home an hour ago. Run back along Washington Street, get Dad and bring him here. You're not going down in that ravine. She's city property now, on the trash dump, and nobody cares what happens, not even Mr. Black. Tell Dad what he's coming here for, and he don't have to be seen coming home with me and her. I'll take her the back way around, and nobody will ever know. She won't be no good to you now. Her machinery all busted. We can't leave her out in the rain, don't you see, Tom? Sure. Tom moved slow, slowly off. Douglas let himself down the hill, walking in piles of cinder and old paper and tin cans. Halfway down, he stopped and listened. He peered at the multicolored dimness, the great landslide below. Madame Tarot, he almost whispered. Madame Tarot? At the bottom of the hill in the moonlight, he thought he saw her white wax hand move. It was a piece of white paper blowing, but he went toward it anyway. The town clock struck midnight. The house lights around were mostly turned out. In the workshop garage, the two boys and the man stood back. They stood back from the witch, who now sat, rearranged and at peace, in an old wicker chair before an oilcloth-covered 
card table upon which were spread in fantastic fans of popes and clowns and cardinals and deaths and sums and comets and the tarot cards upon which one wax hand touched. Father was speaking. Know how it is. When I was a boy, when the circus left town, I ran around collecting a million posters. Later, it was breeding rabbits and magic. I, I built illusions in the attic and couldn't get them out. He nodded to the witch. Oh, I remember. She told my good fortune once, 30 years ago. We'll clean her up good, then come into bed. We'll build her a special case Saturday. He moved out the garage door, but stopped when Douglas spoke softly. Dad, thanks. Thanks for the walk home. Thanks. Heck, said father, and was gone. The two boys left alone, and the witch looked at each. It, it, it left alone with the witch, looked at each other. Gosh, right down the main street we go, all four of us. You, me, Dad, the witch. Dad's one in a million. Tomorrow, said Douglas, I go down and buy the rest of the machine for Mr. Black for ten bucks, or he'll throw it out. Sure, Tom looked at the old woman there in the wicker chair. Boy, she sure looks alive. I wonder what's inside little tiny bird bones. All that's left of Madame Tarot after Napoleon. No machinery? No machinery at all? Why don't we just cut her open and see? I have plenty of time for that, Tom. When? Well, in a year, two years, when I'm 14 or 15, then that's the time to do it. Right now, I don't want to know, except that she's here. Tomorrow I get to work on the spells to let her escape forever. Some night you'll hear that a strange, beautiful Italian girl was seen downtown in a summer dress, buying a ticket for the East, and everyone saw her at the station, saw her on the train as it pulled out, and everyone said she was the prettiest girl they ever saw. And when you hear that, Tom, and believe me, the news will get around fast, nobody knowing where she came from or where she went, then you'll know I worked that spell and set her free. And then, as I said, a year, two years from now, on that night when the train pulls out, it'll be the time when we can cut through the wax. With her gone, you're liable to find nothing but little cogs and wheels and stuff inside her. That's how it is. Douglas picked, picked up the witch's hand and moved it over the dance of life, the frolic of bone-white death, the dates and dooms, the fates and follies, tapping, touching, whispering her worn-down fingernails. Her face tilted with some secret secret equilibrium and looked at the boys and the fla eyes flashed bright in the new in the raw bulb light unblinking tell your fortune tom asked douglas quietly sure a card fell from the witch's voluminous sleeve tom you see that a card hidden away and now she throws it out at us douglas held the card to the light it's blank I'll put it in a matchbox full of chemicals during the night. Tomorrow we'll open the box and there'll be the message. What a little is, what'll it say? Douglas closed his eyes the better to see the words. It'll say, Thanks from your humble servant and grateful friend, Madame Floristan Mariana Tarot, the chiromancer, soul healer, and deep down diviner of fates and furies. Tom laughed and shook his brother's arm. Go on, Doug. What else? What else? Let me see. And it'll say, hey, no, no, it's not fine to dance and sing when the bells of death do ring and turn upon the toe and sing, hey, no, no. And it'll say, Tom and Douglas Spaulding, everything you wish for all your life through you'll get. And it'll say that we'll live forever. You and me, Tom, will live forever. And that's all on just one card? All that, every single bit of it, Tom. In the light of the electric bulb, they bent the two boys' heads down, the witch's head down, staring and staring at the beautiful blank but promising white card, their bright eyes sensing each and every incredibly hidden word that would soon rise up from pale oblivion. Hey, said Tom in the softest of voices, and Douglas repeated in a glorious whisper, Hey. Faintly, the voice chanted under the fiery green trees at noon. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Douglas moved slowly across the lawn. Tom, what are you counting? 
13, 14, shut up, 16, 17, cicadas, 18, 19, cicadas, oh hell, Tom unsqueezed his eyes, hell, 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 better not let people hear you swearing, hell, hell, hell is a place, Tom cried, now I gotta start all over, he's counting the times the cicadas buzz every 15 seconds, held up his two dollar watch, you time it, then add 39, and you get the temperature at that very moment. He looked at the watch, one eye shut, tilted his head, and whispered again. One, two, three. Douglas turned his head slowly, listening. Somewhere in the burning, bone-colored sky, a great copper wire was strumming and shaken. Again and again, the piercing, metallic vibrations, like charges of raw electricity, fell in paralyzing shocks from the stunned tree. Seven counted Tom. Eight. Douglas walked slowly up the porch steps, painfully peered into the hall. He stayed there a moment, then slowly stepped back on the porch and called weakly to Tom. It's exactly 87 degrees Fahrenheit. 27, 28. Hey, Tom, you hear me? I hear you. 30, 31. Get away. 2, 3, 34. You can't, you can stop counting now. Right inside on the old thermometer, it's 87 and going up without help, out the help of no Katie dids. Cicadas, 39, 40, not Katie dids, 42, 87 degrees, I thought you'd like to know. 45, that's inside, not outside. 49, 50, 51, 52, 50. 53, 53 plus 39 is 92 degrees. Who says? I say 90, er, not 87 degrees Fahrenheit, but 92 degrees, Spalding. You and who else? Tom jumped up and stood, red-faced, staring at the sun. Me and the cicadas, that's who. Me and the cicadas. You're outnumbered. 92, 92, 92 degrees, Spalding, by gosh. They both stood looking at the merciless, unclouded sky like a camera that had broken and stared shutter-wide at a motionless and stricken town dying in a fiery sweat. Douglas shut his eyes and saw two idiot suns dancing on the reverse side of the pinky, translucent lids. One, two, three. Douglas felt his lips move. Four, five, six. This time, the cicada sang even faster. We're going to end there. I love the beautiful way that, that Ray Bradbury was able to talk about the passing of a loved one in the eyes of a child. Um, sometimes it's so hard to broach those subjects, especially in a book that, that um, maybe kids, someone's reading to their kids or that they read in the past. But... Um, I remember, I remember when I was 10 years old, my great grandmother had a stroke and I took it upon myself to teach her how to rewrite her name. And I remember how frustrated she would get. And I just didn't want to give up. She wanted to give up, but I just knew I could help her. And it wasn't long later that she, she succumbed to the effects of that stroke. I was devastated. I'll never forget the time I had with her and her daughter, my grandmother, that I miss so much. She always told me I looked like her. In fact, hanging in my home now, which was my grandmother's home, for as long as I can remember since that home was built, was hanging this large oval picture of my great-grandmother. Her name was Caterina Magnino Bertino Imanetto. That's a mouthful. A sassy Italian girl like myself. My grandma would look at that picture and she would tell me, you look just like her. And I would always look at that picture and think, but she's not smiling. I look at it now and I imagine a smile on her face. The picture was taken when she came from Italy on a weeks-long journey 
on a ship and landed in New York where she was presented with a gown to get dressed in to marry the man who had come from Italy a couple years earlier to help make a life for them here. I probably wouldn't have been smiling either. <laughs> My grandma would always point out she didn't even iron that dress. I'm part of her. Part of her is still here, just like in the mirror with Douglas's grandmother. And as long as I have children and possibly grandchildren down the road, part of her will still live. Part of her will still be here. We have one more section of this book. I hope that you're enjoying it. Please leave, leave me a comment so I know what you're thinking. And I'm getting ready to, to pick the next book. If you have any suggestions, leave those in the comments too. Until next time.